This is an oral. If this is an interview for the for the Purdue University's oral history program. Today's date is November 9th, 2012. I am interviewing by phone today a member of Purdue's class of 1958, Mr. Porter Bridwell. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration at Purdue University Libraries Archives and Special Collections. Mr. Bridwell, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today and to, to participate in our program. Um, we're so pleased that you could be available for us. Could you please uh, state your full name and date of birth for our cataloging records? All right, that's uh, Gene Porter Bridwell, October the 4th, 1935. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to start by giving a little introduction by noting that you are a graduate. You've graduated from Purdue University in 1958 with a degree in aeronautical engineering. And then you went right away to work as an engineer in the space industry for the company Rocketdyne in Canoga Park, California. Pretty soon after that, in 1962, you joined NASA at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And at, Na at, at Marshall, you spent the next 34 years um, participating in the research, design, and management of propulsion systems that supported the U.S. space program practically from its inception through the space shuttle years. Then when you retired from NASA in 1996, you retired as the seventh center director of the Marshall Center, the first director, of course, being Werner von Braun. And I just want to say, Mr. Bridwell, we're so pleased that you're able to speak with us today and to share your experiences, your recollections, and insight. Um, and if you're ready to start, I'd, I'd like to um, begin by asking you questions about your early years in education. Um, okay. Okay. Um, where did you grow up, and what was it like? Uh, well, I was born in Linton, Indiana in uh, 1935. I grew up in Terre Haute, Indiana, and uh, in a modest family. My dad was a teacher. He ended up as an elementary uh, principal, and my mother did, uh, you know, substitution work. Um, my dad... Uh, wanted me to go to the Indiana State Laboratory High School where I had grades 1 through 12. At the time, he thought uh, that was uh, the best uh, education I could get uh, as I went through high school, um, which it worked out uh, reasonably well. Uh, I graduated, I guess, in uh, 53 with a class of about 35 or 65. Um, what it was like, uh, I kind of, uh, rightly or wrongly, felt as I looked around at the three other high schools there in Terre Haute, I kind of felt like an outsider. Uh, hmm. That's probably one of my first lessons. Uh, I learned about uh, conforming to your environment. Hmm. Uh, I guess that about sums it up. Uh, uh, um, why, why did you feel like an outsider? I don't know. At the time, I was uh, reasonably, uh, I guess, young. And, uh, uh, the school I went to, all I had was basketball, and the other high schools had, uh, you know, all the sports, and uh, I always kind of felt uh, that uh, I wanted to participate, uh, not so much in sports, but uh, be involved uh, with the other group of, uh, of uh, students that would uh, you know, participated in those three high schools. In fact, I dated for a while uh, a girl that was in one of the schools, and uh, maybe that's where I got uh, a lot more insight uh, about uh, 
the environment she was in versus the environment uh, you know, I was in. Right. It, it was just a different kind of school? The, this. Pretty much so. It, uh, it concentrated, uh, you know, being connected with a university uh, primarily on education, reasonably strict, small, and so forth. Right. But uh, I guess you look back on it, uh, it turned out okay. Yeah. Well, it's good that you had that connection to the other kind of environment, you know, through the, through the girlfriend. And, yeah. um, could I ask you, what, what inspired you to enroll at Purdue? Well, it wasn't any big deal. Uh, at the time, I had a pretty good friend, uh, Mike Dyke. And uh, he was going to enroll in the Rose Poly Technical Institute there at Terre Haute, which uh, now it, even to this day is a pretty fine engineering school. Uh, and I kind of uh, looked at that, looked at Purdue, looked at uh, Indiana University, and uh, for some reason, I really couldn't tell you today, I decided to go to Purdue. Uh, my dad felt reasonably strong when uh, <clears throat> I was a little immature, and he wanted me to go to a junior college uh, before I stepped in uh, to the environment at Purdue University. Uh, of course, at the time, uh, I knew what I wanted to do, and I uh, rejected that uh, recommendation. Why engineering? How did you? When did you know that you you wanted to to follow engineering? I think from day one, and it was a pretty simple type of approach. I felt uh, engineering degree would, uh, within reason, prepare you for any environment that you might step into after college. Mm -hmm. You must have really loved math. <laughs> I enjoyed, always did enjoy uh, math until I got to differential equations in college and uh, uh, kind of struggled with that, uh, to be real frank with you. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's good to be challenged a little, though, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, what was it like to be, what do you remember about being a student at Purdue, and then particularly in the engineering program? Well, number one, it was very difficult for me to, maybe I created that environment. Uh, now, we'll forget, my counselor asked me, did I leave a girlfriend uh, back home? And I told him yes. And he informed me up front, he says, by the end of the first semester, she won't be around. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, he was right. Uh, <laughs> that first semester, you know, I did that. Uh, reasonably well but from the second semester on uh, I really struggled through college <clears throat> yeah um, you know I've interviewed a few people um, who were in the engineering program uh, so far and, and everyone I've talked to has said how difficult it is here at Purdue no one it does I don't think anyone breezed through <laughs> well you know the interesting part about that uh, my roommate was uh, Chesterfield James Jr. at uh, Resident Exhall, and uh, his dad was a college professor at the University of Florida, and uh, he enrolled at that time in a theoretical uh, aeronautical engineering uh, school uh, where uh, you had to take a year of German, and uh, if I look back on it, uh, in fact, we ended up as fraternity brothers. Uh, I don't think he had too difficult time at all. Uh, and here again, I might be wrong. I really never talked to him about that. Well, I, I'm going to... No. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I think some students, uh, you know, can uh, handle the situation. Uh, I know a lot better than what I did. Mm-hmm. Do you have a uh, favorite memory of your time as a student here at Purdue? No, I thought about that, and I really don't. Uh, uh, I, I guess uh, all the time I was looking forward to uh, 
you know, getting out in the real world and uh, seeing what all that was about. And uh, I just kind of uh, either consciously or subconsciously look forward to that. And uh, I don't recall any outstanding uh, type of situation or environment I experienced during college that uh, really stands out for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, you mentioned uh, Chesterfield James and your roommate, and um, I'll be interviewing him in a few weeks as well. And he's the one who who gave me your name. So you two must be you must have made a real good, couple good friends. Yeah, well, uh, we sure were. In fact, uh, I talked to him every once in a while. Uh, but if you talk to him, tell him to stop giving my name out. <laughs> Okay, no one else but me, okay. <laughs> um, do you have any thoughts on how Purdue prepared you for your career? And you know what, are there any just lessons that you felt you, you left Purdue with that carried you, helped you through in your career? Uh, well, rightly or wrongly, uh, you know, uh, the environment that uh, you experience at Purdue, which is probably not unusual uh, for Purdue, but, you know, the very fact that uh, you deal with an environment of uh, quite a few people student-wise and uh, an exposure to different professors. Uh, and I guess the bottom line, uh, it exposes you to uh, to some degree to people in the environment that you might be dealing with after you leave the university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of rigorous or just diverse? What's that? Uh, in terms of the rigor or diversity or just being around professionals here? I think it's being around uh, professional folks and, uh, you know, what they represent. Uh, you know, the majority of them have had a taste of that outside world. And, uh, you experienced that, or at least I did, when I was at Purdue. And, uh, <coughs> and kind of look back on it and uh, feel rightly uh, that that probably had some influence uh, on my life as I got out and, uh, you know, uh, participated uh, in the outside world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, maybe that, that's a, the perfect uh, segue into my questions about your career. Um, so when you graduated from Purdue, you went right to work um, um, in, this, in the space industry. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and then how you came to work at Marshall? Well, uh, excuse me. Sure. At the time, I'd uh, interviewed uh, with Rocket 9 Division of North America, and uh, they offered me a job on the West Coast, and uh, I proceeded, uh, I guess, as a lot of people uh, do. I was married in February uh, 58, and I uh, drove to uh, Southern California and uh, started my career with, uh, with Rocketdyne and ended up uh, on uh, Santa Susana, which is their test facility in the mountains there, uh, and went through uh, quite a bit of training, and then I was reassigned uh, I guess that year in August to uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center. At that time, we had a small cadre of people, rocketing people, uh, on size the Marshall Space Flight Center and uh, supporting uh, two of the engines that Rocketdyne were responsible for. It was the S3D, uh, which was. Uh, primarily a military version, uh, and the H-1 engine, which was uh, utilized primarily uh, by NASA in the early uh, Saturn uh, uh, 
years. Could you explain, um, you know, I'm thinking about students that might be listening to this interview. Could you explain a little bit about how, how the engine, the H1 and the Saturn work together? Uh, well, at that time they were clustered. They were used to, as a booster and uh, been a long time. I can't remember whether there were three or five and uh, uh, they were started by a uh, solid, uh, if you visualize uh, a big firecracker that was ignited and what it did, it turned the turbo pump and primed the engines and uh, reasonably a simple engine and uh, it ran like a jewel. Uh -huh. The S3D was a little more complicated and uh, was used more on the Jupiter and deployed uh, by the military, uh, I think, at that time to Italy. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. But, uh, no, that does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, when I was uh, re researching um, questions to ask, it, it really struck me, you know, that during the 1960s, you know, it was such an extraordinary time in terms of, uh -huh. uh, you know, sp the space program. What, I mean, what was it like to be a, a young, because you, you mentioned, you know, you were just a young engineer at that time. Uh, what was it like to be working on the Saturn systems and, you know, you were, and, and what are your recollections of Werner von Braun? Well, uh, you know, I ended up at Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, and of course my timing was reasonably good. Uh, Rocket I wanted me uh, at Edwards, at that time, they were developing the F-1 engine for the first stage of Saturn, and they wanted to spend a year at Edwards. And I got to Mississippi, and that night called my supervisor and gave him a two-week notice and uh, came back. And, you know, for maybe the purpose of the young folks, there's nothing wrong, in my opinion, career-wise, in knowing uh, location-wise where you'd like to be. Uh, mm -hmm. And I knew at the time, uh, you know, to progress with Rockadine eventually uh, involved the West Coast. So that was uh, probably the driver for me uh, going to work for the Marshall Space Flight Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, walking in uh, at that time, uh, those, that was early stages of uh, you know, the Saturn V vehicle, which had three stages. They had an S1C, S2, and S4B. And the Marshall Space Flight Center were responsible for developing those stages. And uh, I ended up uh, with Spike Field, who was the manager of the S2 program. And... Uh, I got my feet wet uh, pretty quickly from a people standpoint because at that time uh, the management style of Dr. Ben Brown was uh, to have a series of laboratories, uh, propulsion and vehicle engineering lab, astronautics lab, aerodynamics lab, and so forth. and. Uh, headed up by strong-willed uh, German folks, and uh, he managed those people like a, uh, oh, like a jeweled uh, watch. In fact, he deliberately uh, had responsibilities overlapping uh, in order to assure that uh, there was interplay between those folks uh, in the decision process. And I had the uh, opportunity, uh, looking from the outside in, to uh, to watch uh, those labs uh, progress and develop uh, eventually the Saturn V program. And uh, through a series of working groups, uh, which I wasn't a member of, but I always participated from a management standpoint, and by the way, that environment always put up with the managers or the project offices rather reluctantly. 
so that was quite an education on my part and once again uh, in dealing with environments uh, who are headed up uh, by people that probably have a uh, different objectives and approaches than what you do. Hmm. So, so management, um, you know, that's not something they taught at school. <laughs> so it was observation for you and being in that environment. Well, it also the exposure at that time on the S2 stage, we went through three or four managers you know, uh, the Air Force was asked to come in and uh, help the Marshall Space Flight Center manage the Saturn program. And we ended up on S-2 with a uh, uh, colonel, Colonel Yorkin uh, from the Air Force. And uh, that's when my exposure uh, to management really got a shot in arm because uh, he worked with me uh, continuously on simple things like you're in business to assure things happen and not take a lot of credit for it and so forth. And uh, I value that experience to this day that uh, in the early part of my career, I was exposed to that exposed also to a German manager uh, uh, which uh, I remember to this day uh, he told me he grew up in Germany he had uh, one report card through college and uh, he said at that time uh, decisions are made of whether uh, you become an engineer a bricklayer or so forth but he said one subtle difference in uh, the German culture is uh, a bricklayer has just as much respect uh, to the populace uh, as an engineering, uh, an engineering does. And that's always kind of stuck with me a little bit. So I was very fortunate uh, from the exposure standpoint. Yeah. As I grew up in the Martian space flight environment, uh, to get that exposure. Yeah, it sounds like you had some some wonderful mentors there, and examples. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> could you describe your feelings during the Apollo Eleven mission? Uh. Well, I thought about that after you sent me the question quite a bit, and uh, frankly, I just don't recall uh, how I felt. I, I I recall, you know, during all launches, whether you're going to the moon or around the moon and so forth, the responsibility the Marshall Space Flight Center always had uh, <coughs> was lift off of the vehicle to orbit injection and uh, then we kind of breathed a sigh of relief <laughs> and uh, and as I recall you know uh, uh, it might have been naiveness on my part but uh, the thought never entered my mind that uh, we would not be successful uh, on landing on the moon and uh, and uh, I just didn't get that excited about, uh, you know, what Neil Armstrong uh, accomplished. I, I just kind of felt that uh, with uh, all the insight, the uh, checks and balances that uh, NASA and industry had, it was going to be a successful mission. And, uh, rightly or wrongly, it sure turned out that way. Mm hmm So for the for all of the Apollo missions, um, were you folks, you know, you I'm I'm sure, you know, monitoring the launches and uh and breathing that sigh of relief? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um what are what are some of your most memorable moments during the years you worked on the Saturn systems? Or maybe you've already, you know, talked mentioned some of those with the management, but are there are there others? Uh, 
I think, you know, one thing when I go back and I kind of look at my resume uh, and uh, then I think about uh, some of the exposure I've had to uh, younger folks uh, want things to happen overnight and uh, you probably noticed uh, there's a pretty long period of time uh, before uh, we finally uh, stepped in to, uh, I think it was close to 20 years in managing a project. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think about that off and on every once in a while. Yeah, everyone, including the public, sometimes has loses patience, and <laughs> but projects well, take a long time. Well, what's, uh, you know, what we've done, uh, and I don't think overtly, yeah, there's no tolerance for failure, and uh, what I feel we have to keep in mind, the reason you develop things and test things is to find out, you know, what the problems are, and uh, you're never going to have, in my opinion, uh, you know, a total test program or development program. It's not going to have its instance. Uh, but so be it, there's not much I can do about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I understand in 1975 you began to work at the Shuttle Projects office at Marshall. Could you tell us, talk a little bit about the transition period between the Apollo program and the beginning of the Space Shuttle era? Well, it's pretty straightforward because uh, on the the Saturn program, my direct supervisor was Jim Oldham, and uh, when I transferred uh, at the end of, uh, well, that program really wasn't at the end, but when I transferred into the external tank uh, project office, Jim was project manager, so uh, it was, uh, at least from a people standpoint, a big step for me. Uh, uh, what was uh, uh, a step for me was uh, once again uh, my educational prog uh, progress uh, became involved when I uh, had to learn to uh, not only manage but manage in an environment uh, where a chief engineer uh, was involved and uh, on a dotted line reported directly to the project manager uh, but on a solid line was in the science and engineering directory and uh, you know with a staff of people and he was responsible for the technical aspects of the project and uh, managing in that environment uh, was uh, somewhat of an education for me. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about um, the work that your teams did during that time? I, and I'm thinking like up to the first launch of the space shuttle. Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, when you talk about the shuttle project, so you talk about when uh, I managed all three projects or when I was a manager on the external tank? Well, maybe a, a little bit of all. <laughs> 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 I know you, I'm sure. Well, in both cases, well, in the external tank, I was project manager and uh, you're in business to assure things happened. Uh, and we used to tell potential uh, managers uh, that you've got to uh, have a mentality of assuring things happen and not take a lot of credit for that. And uh, particularly as a project manager, you uh, had to assure that things did happen and you had the responsibility uh, <coughs> to manage that contractor, uh, which at that time was Mark Marietta. Mm -hmm. uh, corporation and uh, they uh, developed and fabricated the external tank at the Manchu facility 
only in New Orleans. Uh, so he had the responsibility to represent them uh, in a constructive way at the same time uh, represent the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, and their do's and don'ts on uh, what should be involved in the development of that element. Now, as a pro shuttle project manager where I had the responsibility and I reported to uh, JSC on a dotted line, uh, had the responsibility for uh, the SRB, SRN, external tank, uh, and the uh, shuttle uh, SSME engines. And uh, once again, uh, you know, I just represented those three project managers uh, and assured uh, they accomplished uh, what they set out to do, and uh, that was kind of uh, interesting experience, and uh, uh, pretty uh, pretty much a fulfilling uh, experience uh, to represent those managers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was you know during some 1975 to through the early 80s. I think so. Getting those systems ready to go. <laughs> Could you describe what it was like for you and your teams during the hours and the minutes that led up to that first launch of the space shuttle STS-1 in April of 81? Well, at the time, uh, you know, I was working for uh, Jim Odom, who was a project manager of the external tank. and. Uh, I was uh, in Huntsville, Alabama at our uh, launch support facility where we had data and monitored the countdown and so forth. But, uh, everything, uh, you know, as I recall, went reasonably well. I can't recall whether we had any delays or not, but uh, it was my first interview uh, with the press prior to the launch. That was quite an experience uh, <laughs> for a young uh, young engineer. Uh, my wife told me at the time I was on a uh, stool, which you know rotates. Uh huh. <laughs> and she said it was hard to follow you because you were re rotating the damn stool all the time. <laughs> but uh, I guess it worked out all right. <laughs> But as I recall, that countdown and that launch, uh, you know, went okay. And uh, I never will forget uh, when Jim got back uh, after a couple of days. Uh, I had answered the phone. I don't know whether you recall or not, but John Young and Bob Crippen flew that mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, I answered the phone down the hall, and he said, uh, this is Bob Crippen, and I'm returning Jim Odom's call. And, uh, you know, I about dropped the phone. <laughs> ran down the hall and got my boss. Since then, uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to work with both those guys. And, uh, they're last of an era. Can you talk a little bit about that? What do you mean? Well, uh, you know, through the process, uh, part of my career development, uh, uh, I've been exposed. In fact, I worked for Bob Crippen when he was associate administrator for manned space flight. And John Young was kind of our conscious in all conscience in all of our flight readiness reviews for show. He was there not only representing the astronaut group, but uh, the experience that he had over the years. And, uh, uh, he wasn't a thorn in our side, but uh, he sure laid things on the table to make us think about where we were and where we were going and uh, what we ought to be doing. And, uh, you know, I value my exposure uh, to both those individuals today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I still exchange uh, Christmas cards with Bob Crippen. Uh, he was uh, he was one of 
one of my favorites. I never will forget one time he told me, he says, you know, Porter, if uh, I could capture uh, uh, zero G while you're in space and bring it back to Earth, he said, you and I could make a fortune. <laughs> but, uh, they're interesting individuals, dear. <laughs> Um, I want to um, ask you one more question about that first launch of the shuttle. You, I read something that you guys stayed up all night uh, monitoring data. Yeah. I'm sure that's a was a common occurrence. Not much sleep. Oh yeah, I uh, well, being on the external tank. Uh, and later on, I became manager. I was required to be at Cape Canaveral, and uh, uh, they always start tanking, uh, putting fuel in the external tank, uh, oh, seven to ten hours prior to launch. Of course, you always had a morning launch, and that meant you were in there, uh, you know, uh, early or late in the evening, uh, all night while that was going on. So uh, that at least wasn't unusual. Uh, I got a lot of exposure with it. By the way, I don't miss it too much. <laughs> I'm sure not. Yeah, it's good to get sleep sometimes. Um, could you, um, let's see. In the 1990s, I was interested to read that uh, one of your assignments uh, at NASA headquarters was to lead a team to to lead the integration of the Russian elements of the international international space station systems, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what 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 that was like. Uh, well, it involved. Uh, I think I think there were ten or twelve Russians over here uh, participating in that redesign, uh, and. Uh, at the time, uh, when we started uh, working with them, uh, they always wanted a translator because they pretended like they couldn't understand English. And, uh, <laughs> they they did, by the way, ever since they were words you were saying. <laughs> and uh, I had uh, Dave Manley uh, work with me, and he was kind of a chief engineer and worked directly with those 12 Russians. And he finally told him one time, he was tired of all of it, he says, as far as I'm concerned, you can get on an airplane and go back to Russia. And uh, would you believe the next day they came in talking English, and uh, from that day on there was a complete love in uh, <laughs> between David and uh, the rest of us. Uh, in fact, uh, they always ate and drank in their motel rooms, and they always saved one dollar bills. And they loved blue jeans. Well, they take <laughs> back, I don't know how many blue jeans with them. But anyway, uh, <laughs> conclusion all that, they invited David and I over to celebrate in their motel room, and uh, at the time gave us Russian medals. And uh, to this day, I have no idea what those represented, but. Uh, they uh, seem to be pretty proud of me. But it was a it was an interesting experience. And uh, by the way, they're pretty intelligent folks. Uh, with one flaw, which shouldn't surprise people, uh, they had the slightest idea about cost. Oh. If you, if you look at the environment that they work in, and I assume they still work in. You know, the government takes care of all the dollars and they just tell them to go do their thing. Right. And, and, and uh, that was kind of interesting uh, to me uh, as we worked with. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting experience. And they must, have had, they must have had to get used to, you know, watching the budget and there were certain things maybe they wanted to do that just couldn't happen or... <laughs> Well, uh, the mission they were over here for, uh, they really didn't have to get involved in that too much. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it was more from a technical standpoint that where we were at the time the space station and where should we be going not only with them but our European uh, partners mm-hmm. interesting experience by the way yeah um, and I was thinking about um, were you uh, going back to your early career uh, working in the space program were you was it real um, were you conscious of the, the what the Russians were doing I mean was it was it always there or was it sort of just you didn't think about that as you were developing these systems well I'm not uh, we probably thought about it uh, indirectly or subconsciously directly at times uh, what uh, I think the country might not realize that Congress was very, very sensitive at the time from a technology standpoint to fund NASA and DOD to assure that uh, our technology exceeded and stayed ahead of Russia. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the Iron Curtain came down, uh, that threat went away and uh, that's when we began at least my NASA standpoint see uh, quite a bit of erosion uh, with our support with Congress yeah yeah that competition wasn't there anymore that's right yeah um, I guess I'm, I'm gonna uh, move into the last two questions that I had um, what are your thoughts on the future of human space exploration? Well, I thought about that, and of course, my insights are not very good today. Not that I had a lot, uh, even when I was working, but uh, I just don't see a commitment uh, for manned space flight and uh, the technology that comes from that. And, uh, what uh, you know really uh, ought to be bothered in this country, uh, both from a DOD and, stand- and NASA standpoint, is so it's so important to nourish and develop our technology. And uh, rightly or wrongly, you know, uh, it's a pretty expensive proposition for industry to do, and. Uh, that to me is the role of the government from a dollar standpoint, and uh, I just don't see that happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll probably take a another um, another type of competition or some other motivation that we'll have to wait for for that. It point. always always happens. Doesn't it? Yeah. Um. Is there anything, Mr. Bridwell, that I haven't asked you that you think I should have? No, I guess the bottom line, if I look back at my career and uh, you ask me uh, uh, maybe what's the most important uh, oh, uh, action, emotion, or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, I've experienced uh, I tell uh, these young folks, uh, you've got to learn to conform to your environment. You know, uh, might take some time, but uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, it's worked out reasonably well for me, and uh, you probably won't believe me, but uh, I never had a goal in my life. I just kind of did what I was told to that environment uh, I was exposed to. And, uh, I guess from a timing standpoint, it worked out reasonably well. Right, and you were fortunate to, yeah, timing and to be in the right place at Marshall and um, working with, it sounds like, very good people who were, who were setting goal, excellent goals. Yeah, they're best of the best. Um, mm-hmm. Well, thank you very, very much, and um, it's really been a pleasure to talk with you and to 
and I'm, I'm very grateful for you sharing these experiences and, and your thoughts. I think it's, it's really important to, uh, for others to be able to hear these things. Okay, well, thank you. Now, you've got a responsibility to me. Okay. Can you do that for me? Yes. When you review all this, if you don't find there's any value added, you know, mm -hmm. just forget about it. <laughs> Is that fair enough? That's fair enough. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Bridwell. One other question. Yes. When do you want, when do you want me to sign that? these two sheets you said um at your convenience you can do that um you know with what go ahead oh whenever it's convenient for you and then i will send you the transcript of of this uh tape for you to for the, of the interview for you to look over if i get the transcript i guess i have to conclude you there's a low value added <laughs> Well, I'm, I, I can tell right now that it's a very high value, and I'm so grateful. <laughs> Thank well, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you both have a nice day, okay? Thank you. You too. Okay. And by the way, go do something about our football team. <laughs> That's Katie's job over here. <laughs> yeah. Just say I an extra, pr extra prayer, you know. It's not I, going very well. I tell you what, I've been defending the Big Ten and Purdue since I've been down here since 58. <laughs> FAC country, and it's extremely difficult. <laughs> Especially this year, huh? Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, We're well, hanging in there, though. Oh. Okay. I hope so. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>